climate change is here today with ever increasing emissions, driving ever increasing temperatures from devastating heat waves to floods, droughts, even diseases. Everyone's asking, why did nobody warn us? And well, because we kind of did. Climate scientists like myself have been sounding the alarm for years, but exactly how many years? Given that the basic science behind the greenhouse effect is some 200 years old, when did the alarm first sound? I want to look back at some of the earliest climate change warnings and see how they hold up today. Let's get started. The very first warning is from a newspaper, and while you're listening to it and reading it, I want you to drop in the comments when exactly you think it's from. Coal consumption affecting climate. The furnaces of the world are now burning about 2 billion tonnes of coal a year. When this is burned, uniting with oxygen, it adds about 7 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere yearly. This tends to make the air a more effective blanket for the earth and to raise its temperature. The effect may be considerable in a few centuries. This is from 1912, 110 years ago. I think some people still have this idea that climate science is brand new, but here it is in print in a newspaper over a century in the past. Considering that this little newspaper article gets so much right, why are those last four words so wrong? in a few centuries. Well, that's because as much as we were burning coal and other fossil fuels back then, we're burning vastly more today. In fact, 10 times more per year than we were back in 1912. And so we've achieved in just one century what they thought we'd achieve in several. God, humans are such overachievers. Let's jump now to 1938, and we have kind of the opposite of a warming warning, a warming celebration, if you will. Guy Callender is a key climate scientist from the early mid 20th century. He was the first to notice carbon dioxide levels increasing in the atmosphere, as well as temperatures increasing, making a link between the two. But he kind of thought that this was a good thing, that, the return of the deadly glaciers should be delayed indefinitely. And I mean, yes, loads of extra CO2 and heat would stop another ice age, but what did Calendar think would happen to all the glaciers that were already here today? I kind of feel like he was halfway through this thought and then just got distracted. But Calendar is still one of the most important figures in the history of climate science, so I can't stay mad at him for too long. Thanks, Adam. You're welcome, Guy. But now it's time to get serious. Here's a warning not just in the press, not just in the academic literature, but directly to a president of the United States of America. Scientist Charles David Keeling is responsible for one of the most important graphs, well, maybe ever. It's called the Keeling Curve, and you know you're a big deal when you have an entire curve named after you. It shows the yearly oscillations of carbon dioxide levels, as well as the year-on-year -year rise in those levels. And in 1965, Keeling wrote a report to then-President Lyndon B. Johnson, warning him of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels the invisible pollutant. And I mean, what a cool turn of phrase, the invisible pollutant. How did that not immediately get turned into a B-movie? Anyway, in the report, Keeling warned, Through his worldwide industrial civilization, man is unwittingly conducting a vast geophysical experiment. As well as that, This will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that marked changes in climate not controllable through local or even national efforts could occur. So already showing a deep understanding that this is a global problem that can only be tackled globally. 
Keeling also mentions the possibilities of deliberately bringing about countervailing climatic changes therefore need to be thoroughly explored. There are two things I find incredible about this. The first is that it's such a clear warning to the President of the United States of America some 60 years ago, so long before climate change entered the public consciousness and so, so long before any kind of meaningful action on climate change. But the second thing is that Keeling seems to be suggesting that the solution is some kind of geoengineering, something to cool the planet back down rather than just stopping emitting carbon dioxide in the first place. And honestly, some people still fall into this mental trap some 60 years later. Okay, let's fast forward to 1978, and I want to reflect on a couple of statements from scientist James Black. Some countries would benefit, but others would have their agricultural output reduced or destroyed. So here already in 1978, we have warnings not just about damage, but destruction to agricultural output. Another thing I find interesting is this talk of potential benefits to some countries, something some people still talk about today. What this ignores, of course, is the fact that the agricultural system, the economic system, is global, as anyone who's tried to heat their homes or fill up their gas tank lately knows. Present thinking holds that man has a time window of five to ten years before the need for hard decisions regarding changes in energy strategies might become critical. So that's putting the need to act at around 1990. That might seem kind of early, but actually if we had started cutting emissions in 1990, we would have been able to cut them fairly slow and steady and still limit global warming to relatively safe levels. What actually happened is, well, more on that in a little bit. But first, who was this scientist, James F. Black, who was warning so clearly about the dangers of climate change all the way back in the 1970s? Well, he was a senior scientist at Exxon. Yes, the oil company, Exxon. What's amazing about this is that Exxon knew so much so early. They then went on to do a whole bunch more climate change research. But then they made the calculated decision to sow doubt about climate science. Black warned that we had five to ten years before tough decisions. Well, Exxon has helped keep us undecided for decades. We now come to perhaps the most famous climate change warning of all time. In 1988, NASA scientist James Hansen addressed Congress in the United States of America. The Earth is warmer in 1988 than at any time in the history of instrumental measurements. Our computer climate simulations indicate that the greenhouse effect is already large enough to begin to affect the probability of extreme events such as summer heat waves. To reporters after the event, he put it even more bluntly. It is time to stop waffling so much and say that the evidence is pretty strong that the greenhouse effect is here. To many, this is when the background climate change warnings exploded into the mainstream. Just a couple of years later came the first IPCC, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, report on the topic. And then a couple of years after that came the first United Nations negotiations. And not wanting to give too many spoilers, but those negotiations didn't solve climate change. So what's happened since then? Well, 1988, the year of Hansen's warning, was indeed exceptionally hot. At the time, a record-breakingly hot year. But this is what the years since then have looked like. By today's standards, 1988 wouldn't be record-breakingly hot. It would be exceptionally cool. And what about emissions? How has that rise in carbon dioxide levels, first spotted by Guy Callender all the way back in 1938, developed? Well, also not great. You see, we're now emitting record-breaking amounts. And since that James Hansen 1988 congressional hearing, the total carbon dioxide emissions from humanity have doubled. So even though humans have been burning fossil fuels in substantial amounts since the 1700s, half of all the carbon dioxide we've produced 
we've produced in just the last 30 odd years. So with warning after warning after warning, we've just been making the problem worse and worse and worse. I don't want to say we told you so, but I mean, we didn't not tell you so. So where does that leave us now? What are the warnings of today? Well, the world's goal and the ideal target of the Paris Climate Agreement is to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This would limit extreme weather increases and help offer some protection to even the most vulnerable nations and ecosystems. To do this, we need to hit reverse and fast. We need to get to overall zero emissions by 2050. What does this net zero by 2050 actually mean? Well, I have a video all about that up here. And here's the kind of warnings that we have today. In this case, from a lead author from the latest IPCC report. The world can prevent severe impacts on people and on nature, but there is a brief and rapidly closing window to act. This may all sound very depressing, and that's because it kinda is. But it's important to note the tide is turning and warnings are finally getting listened to. In just the last few years, we've seen activist movements rise up on scales that no one thought was possible, least of all me. And the general public now ranks climate change as one of their top concerns across the globe. This is having real effects. Major news outlets are now finally starting to take climate change seriously and give it some of the attention that it deserves. And countries are now pledging and acting to cut their emissions. So yes, we've ignored a painful number of warnings these past decades, and climate science is anything but new but it feels like we're finally beginning to grasp what we're up against. Whether it's pushing for structural changes, cutting our own emissions, or amplifying scientists' warnings, let's make sure together that we don't miss any more chances. So what does Net Zero 2050 actually mean, and is it even possible? Well, to find out, you're going to want to watch my video over here, and you're going to want to like, comment, and subscribe so that the algorithm has a lovely day. Okay, until next time. Bye. This is ludicrous.